Okay, so we are started recording. Um, for those of y'all, I think, Peggy, I'm not sure if you've been to one of Sherry's programs before or not, but um, she is one of our specialists out of UGA Griffin. Um, she's in charge of the Master Gardener program, and she is now, she just recently got her PhD. So congratulations. Well, I guess recent. Well, been, been a minute because of COVID, but we'll just, we'll still say it's recent. <laughs> oh, it <Julie> is. <laughs> yes. The floor is all yours. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Haley. And thank you to all of you for joining in. Um, yes, I was just telling my family this morning that this time last year, I was finishing up my dissertation and just entering into that whole defense um, process that goes along with earning a PhD. And Whew. Oh man, that was tough. So each year has its challenges, right? So glad to be with you today and talk about um, herbs. Um, I, I, I'm guessing, Haley, that this group probably already knows a lot about herbs. Yeah. 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 So I may not tell you something that's like rocket science new, uh, but when we get into how we enjoy them, maybe that, maybe you'll come away with a few tidbits. But when I talk about herbs today and enjoying those that we grow, I'm going to give you um, some historical backgrounds in some cases and some, um, some previous uses. But I just want to say that you're, you're going to see how these um, herbs have been used in, say, maybe um, a medical application as medicine or treatment. And what I am telling you today is not. It is in no way, shape, or form. Um, any sort of um, med medicinal recommendation uh, from me because I am not your medical doctor. So um, with any drug, uh, with any herb, talk to your doctor before you start using that product. So just putting that disclaimer out there um, for all of us. Um, when we talk about herbs, it's helpful to make sure we're on the same page about what we're talking about. And I look to the Herb Society of America who's, who defines uh, uh, herbs as plants that we value because of their flavor or their fragrance or maybe these medicinal and healthful qualities. Um, in some cases it's an economic use. Uh, sometimes um, our plants are uh, have pesticidal properties and that's certainly valuable to us in, in some settings. And in other cases we can use our plants as dyes, you know, to color fabric or, or other types of um, uh, materials. In fact, one of these days I'm going to do one of those uh, classes on, you know, dyeing Easter eggs, you know, with our plant dyes. That would be a lot of fun. So, um, you know, when we talk about herbs and, and what do they, how they function and what do they do, um, they may have uh, ingredients that work together. We talk about synergy, you know, when you, you know, things, you have it independently, they do one thing, you put them together and the sum of those two exceeds, you know, their individual uh, contributions. Um, sometimes we can have uh, individual compounds that are, that's actually toxic to us. So we, so, um, you know, if you start talking about um, doses and poisons and all of that sort of stuff, we know that the right dose makes the difference between a poison and a remedy. Uh, so some of the things that are in our plants, uh, you know, sometimes they're acidic. These are uh, uh, properties that are sour and antiseptic and they have cleansing properties. So a lot of our citrus species are of, of that nature. Um, alkaloids, things that are bitter, uh, that uh, can, can have toxic or even addictive properties. We think about our poppies, our papavers. I love to say that word, papaver. Um, that's just fun. Um, and then even plants that have glycosides in it. So these are um, uh, components that can affect our heart. Uh, so our digitalis species, for example, uh, digitalis you might recognize as a foxglove. Um, but all throughout our history, human history, uh, you will see history of plants. Uh, that plants have always been, I think of them um, like our early pharma pharmacies. You know, we didn't always, I used, I think I wrote this in a, in a high school English paper. We didn't always have CVS on the corner, uh, you know, downtown, um, but we did have herb gardens. We had, we had plant collections and, you know, you can find them um, in uh, tombs and, and uh, temples and um, the herbs and flowers had meaning to people because they were uh, parts of worship rituals and just everyday things. Um, so wherever we have cultivation, um, 
uh, with buildings, you know, we tend to have gardens that are orderly. We think of those not gardens. When we think of herb gardens, just very clipped and, and um, carefully tended things. And, you know, our monasteries, you know, or had those plantings, um, formal gardens. Uh, it, in large part, these gardens were um, enclosed for protection from animals and all of us who have dealt with deer or rabbits or squirrels or raccoons or whatever understand protecting our plants from, from animals. Um, but these gardens, uh, you know, were literally these collections of plants that first of all, increased our knowledge of plants, but also uh, had those, all those properties and were used in everyday um, uh, uh, living, you know, whether it's cooking or, or medicine. So a lot of monastery gardens had um, herbs for healing. And if you look at that Latin word, which is very common, um, a, a very common species for many plants, the officina was a traditional storeroom. Uh, where um, where herbs and medicines were were kept, and so we see that that species name is very often officinalis. So just it's always fun to make these kinds of connections. Um, in the 16th century, um, our universities had physic gardens um, that that were used to teach botany and medicine, and these became the botanical gardens that we know today. There's a picture there of the arbor um, the Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia, and their um, their conservatory. All right, so with just that little background that plants indeed have been a long part of human history that, that we don't um, um, exist without them. Plants are certainly very important to people. Um, I'll bring it right into our kitchen. So if we were going to be cooking, when we think about herbs, we think about cooking, we think about food preparation. Um, and so we're looking for plants that are both edible and attractive. Um, and we use, uh, use, it, use our plants for food, medicine, fiber, um, ornamental appeal, all of those kinds of things. But some of those herbs that we're probably most familiar with, and I bet this group in here is most familiar with things like basil. Oh, golly, I've got, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen basil varieties planted in my garden. Um, and they can be used for many different things. I'll talk about this at, at the, um, towards the end of the presentation, some specific examples. Uh, but we can use the leaves to, to chop up and, you know, you've got oils and stuff that come from this. There's many varieties of basil. Some people will call it basil. Um, I have cinnamon basil in my garden and it has a distinctive scent of, base, of cinnamon. I have lemon and the lemon basil, when I brushed by it the other day, the lemon scent was sweeter and stronger than some of the other lemon scented herbs I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so it's kind of unusual and that will give you a little twist, you know, on that scent and, and impact where, what you use it um, in combination with. We think of basil a lot with uh, tomatoes and, um, um, gosh, what do we, else do we use basil with? I think of it with, you know, a lot of Italian foods that are, that are um, tomato based. But anyway, uh, Asimum basilicum, the, the genus and species there, our basil herbs are annual. So you'll recall that that's a plant that we plant every year. It's not winter hardy. It's going to complete its life cycle, uh, go from that vegetative stage all the way through flowering and seed production one year. Uh, most of our basils are about one and a half to two feet in height and they'll make nice little bushy mounds. You know, if you don't keep the flowers cut off of them, they, they're quite attractive as an ornamental. And as I showed you that last picture, there's a lot of variation in their foliage color and leaf size. And I even have um, some purple basils in bloom right now where the sepals are actually purple. So it looks, you know, from a distance, it looks like the flowers are purple. So it's a, quite attractive. Uh, basil requires sun and a well-drained site. And um, most of the time you're probably sitting there thinking, why does she have flowers on her basil? Because we don't want that to happen. Ideally, if we're using basil as an herb in the kitchen, we want to keep those flowers pinched um, to enhance that flavor. And um, um, yeah, it's been a busy summer. I'll just leave it at that. So I'm just enjoying, I'm doing it intentionally. Uh-huh, yeah. All right, so another herb you're probably familiar with is oregano, oregonum vulgari. So lots of different cultivars available here, a couple different species as well. So I'm talking about vulgari, but there's a couple species. Um, oregano is culinary, so we can use this herb in our cooking. It's edible. 
but it's also ornamental. And so you can use different oreganos in your garden landscape, it makes a great ground cover. And some of them have longer flower scapes on them and you can even cut them and bring them inside like as cut flower. Uh, oreganos, most of them are perennial, though as you go north, um, some of you'll lose some of the range on some of the uh, different oreganos. Um, and generally, the drier and the poorer the soil, the better the flavor. Now, as gardeners, all of you should be saying, yeehaw, because um, we can have some pretty wretched soil. And in the summertime here, if it gets hot and we haven't had rain, uh, it can be pretty, um, pretty difficult to grow things in and, and oregano will be just fine. Uh, so that's good to know. And this is a picture just to show you the, the, the range in terms of the, you know, the flowers and some um, Oregano will be pretty tight and mounted. Some will be more sprawly. Uh, we've got the Arium cultivar, which is gold. We've got some variegated forms, uh, but that classic um, straight up uh, oregano, good for the garden, good, I mean, good for our food. Um, and when we, again, talking about common herbs in the kitchen, we can't go very far without talking about mint. I wish right now I had a nice cup or glass of iced mint tea. I find that extremely refreshing when I've been in the garden. But as gardeners, you're probably all cringing and thinking, what is she saying to me this morning? Why would I plant mint in my garden? Because it's going to go everywhere. Um, it does tend to be very aggressive in our gardens. Um, it's kind of fun to mow over it with the lawnmower, actually. It's, you get that, that scent of... Uh, of mint that, that comes up. Um, but if you've got a difficult spot, uh, you know, that you need to get some ground cover on, uh, your peppermints will definitely, your mints will definitely uh, do that for you. But we can use mints in many different ways, as I indicated there, teas, desserts, salads, fruits, ice creams, I mean, just all kinds of different things that we can use it. Um, there is peppermint, um, that mentha ex uh, piperita, uh, it's got that lilac flower to it. Uh, we can use that. And we've got apple mint. Uh, you might, some of you might have seen this. If you've gotten into any of these um, flavored mints, I've got pineapple mint in my garden. Um, you get that initial scent of, uh, or initial center flavor of mint, and then behind it is that fruity or that little difference in flavor. Um, you've got spearmint, that mintha spicata, uh, it's a white flower. Um, all of those sharing those same uh, kinds of characteristics. All right, another good, excellent herb for the garden. This is dill. Um, this is a cool season annual. Uh, you'll see biennial because sometimes it'll, it'll uh, persist like through the fall and, and uh, do its flowering in the spring. Um, but if to the untrained eye, you might think it's fennel, uh, but um, very distinct scent to it. Uh, they can be quite tall, uh, very attractive in bloom. Uh, it will self-seed. I, I don't have to sow dill in my garden anymore. It does its own thing. Um, and in fact, we're on, we're on about the third crop of dill in my garden right now. And I just let it go to seed and let it do its thing. And it's a fantastic food source for pollinators. Uh, so for the larval form of, uh, we often get a lot of swallowtails in my garden. So um, if the dill, dill is is in leaf and has a lot of leaf surface area, then we'll get a lot of pollinators that will, that will die, um, take, take it on. But you, it is edible in terms of the foliage. Um, and of course, the seeds are used in breads and, and such. Um, do we have any cilantro lovers on here today? Haley's shaking her head, Susan is, yeah. Um, I usually, people either love it or hate it. And that's cool. We are cilantro loving people here at my household. We love it. Um, cilantro is very short lived. It is cool season. So you can grow it like right now in the fall. Um, this particular fall in, in um, Spalding, Lamar counties uh, is, is, is on the cool side. Last year, this time it was so hot, it would not have um, sprouted. It would not have, have um, thrived. Uh, so we see it, you know, in the late fall, the cooler parts of the year, and in the early spring. Um, uh, cilantro is another one of those unique plants in terms of the herbal cat uh, category where we eat the leaves, we eat the seeds. Uh, you can grind the seeds, you know, so we know the seeds is coriander, we know the leaves is cilantro. Um, very distinctive smell. Some people think it smells like soap or, or, or worse things, um, but... Uh, like I said, it's one thing you either love or don't love. And I will say, I'll switch back here, 
will say cilantro in bloom is wonderful for the pollinators. It has a little white uh, flower to it and um, you'll get a lot of pollinators, a lot of insect activity on those blooms. And you have to look close. They're not ginormous insects, but uh, you have to look close, but it does serve a great purpose in our, in our landscape um, ecology there. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with chives. If you bake potatoes and like chives on them, you're probably familiar with that. Allium shenopresum, that's a fun word to say as well. Uh, this is a perennial, forms a clump. Um, bees bloom in early spring. So this is a little bit different from um, its counterpart, the garlic chives, the Allium sativum. And uh, if you've got these in your garden, you know that they have just finished their blooms. They're actually in the process of forming seed heads right now. And I love them in bloom. Um, I try to cut them and bring them in. They do have that, that strong flavor, that distinct garlicky flavor. Uh, you can use the foliage as you would um, the regular uh, chives. Uh, but the, the complaint, the one complaint I have about garlic chives is that they can be weedy. You know, if you let them go to seed, they will produce a lot of seed and then you will have garlic chives everywhere. Um, they're pretty easy to fork up and, and pull out of my garden, but um, you know, just, just FYI. On the other hand, they're so drought resistant, so easy to grow, they get a lot of insect activity and they're just a really strong bloomer, uh, you know, in the late summer that, you know, I, I let them be, I let them do their thing. And I'm learning, I'm learning to get out there more quickly and clip those spent seed heads before they, uh, you know, those spent flower heads before they set seed and make a mess. Another common herb that we use is sage, salvia officinalis. So there's that, that species officinalis. Um, this is, this can be perennial. It's pretty tough to grow here in Georgia. Um, this is one of those Mediterranean shrub, uh, Mediterranean herbs that really requires dry soil to so dry roots and likes, you know, the moisture coming to it uh, in, in the air. So we can have a hard time uh, growing sage in our heavy clay soils. But when we can get them to grow and grow well, then we've got a lot of different ornamental selections. You know, the tricolor, which is purple, white, and green. Uh, the bear garden that has that broad gray, silvery um, foliage. And then of course the, uh, the one on the lower right-hand side there with the, the kind of the greenish, yellowish um, variegation to it. That looks so attractive in a container garden. So those are all options for us. Then there's marjoram. If you remember that, that's a distinctive cooking flavor. There's some recipes that I have to have marjoram or you know uh, others won't do. Um, it's very often confused with oregano and you can see that they say, share the same species, um, but just a subtle difference in, in flavor. And it is one of those, those herbs used in combinations with herb, herb de, de Provence. I, can't, I cannot pretend, I did pretend, but I shouldn't pretend to, to speak French. Um, so anyway, a photograph there of our sweet marjoram. And then thyme, oh my goodness, there's a lot of option here in terms of um, thyme, and that's not T-I-M-E, that's T-H-Y-M-E, the greatest of garden puns there. Um, so our thymes are perennial, and we have lots of different varieties to choose from. Um, this, can, this actually has been used historically as a disinfectant. Isn't that, isn't that uh, good to know? Um, but great, uh, great in terms of cooking flavor. Uh, I can't have a turkey without some thyme thrown in there. Um, I have a couple of recipes where that, that herb is critical. But here's some, some photos of that. I love the variegated thymes, that both the one on the bottom right and the one in the upper left. Uh, the flower, just a real sweet, dainty flower on that. But uh, you know, another one of those nice ground cover types of herbs. Then quickly move it on to French tarragon. Um, I don't use this a whole lot. I don't know if any of you all do, but this is a perennial. It's, a real, it's an artemisia. Uh, so, so perennial in our garden likes that sun location. You can put it in a container um, and certainly something that you can add to your salads or your vegetables. I think of carrots, tarragon carrots for some reason when I think of that herb. A lot of us have rosemary in our garden. Uh, just wouldn't think of a garden as complete without it. This again is another one of those Mediterranean herbs that if it's too wet, um, it's not going to be very happy. We try to bring it inside in the winter time. Um, especially around the holidays, we'll start seeing those, those pyramidal clipped head, uh, uh, container uh, rosemaries. Then we, we love to bring them inside. And, and nine times out of 10, they just struggle. We typically keep them too wet um, uh, on their roots and then keep the top too dry in our, in our uh, dry homes. 
Um, but this is typically perennial here in Georgia. They can get very large, uh, like a shrub, uh, but it is priceless in terms of its flavor uh, for vegetables and meat. So from a culinary perspective in the kitchen, a very valuable herb. I wonder if any of you are familiar with lavender as a culinary herb. Have any of you thought about that? We probably think, associate more uh, lavender with therapeutic benefits, you know, relaxation and, you know, just, um, you know, sleep and all that kind of stuff, very relaxing, but we can actually cook with lavender. Um, it is a perennial. It can be a little uh, uh, finicky in our heavy clay soils. Um, so we've got to have those well-drained spots and lots of sun. Uh, but it is an extremely popular fragrance for candles and lotions and um, soaps and scrubs and things like that. But it can be eaten, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in some of our recipes and, and uh, applications and so forth. I find that that perfumey scent that I love in my hand lotion and soap, I don't really like in my food. So um, there's that little, that little uh, opinionated uh, side to it. But Lots of variation in its size. It can be a great addition to the flower garden, again, from the insect um, activity, but also because they are usually pretty compact plants and, you know, they stay that, you know, they have pretty uniform size to it. So they, they have a, um, an attractive appearance in the garden. Here's another, uh, a lemon flavored herb. I mentioned earlier some of the lemon thyme. We've got um, lemon basil. This is lemon balm. So Melissa officinalis, and it is perennial. Uh, two to three feet in height. Um, and when I have this bullet here that says prefers moist, poor soil in the sun, I'm very sincere about that. Uh, I planted it in two locations, one in a container which has this wretched potting mix um, that I'm not a fan of. Um, the plant is thriving there and, and, you know, just I couldn't have abused it more probably. Um, when I planted it into another part of my uh, garden in a you know, mixed border there where I had to carefully amended the soil and all of that kind of stuff, it's not thriving so well. So I'm very sincere when I say that this particular herb really likes poor soil. Uh, but we use that lemon scented, uh, lemon uh, fragrance uh, foliage, flavored foliage I should say, in all different kinds of foods, um, teas, breads, um, beverages, and even in things like potpourri, things where we want that smell, you know, that fragrance to linger. Um, I've also grown lemon verbena. So this, I think, has a little bit more pungent scent to it. Um, this is not um, a perennial uh, for us. This is something that we would bring indoors and, and uh, over winter, maybe in our garage or something like that. But it does have a tremendously strong lemon flavor and is great for a bunch of different culinary uses. Um, parsley, another one of those herbs that we're all probably very familiar with. I meant to take another picture of that, of the parsley in my garden. It is now being consumed by caterpillars. And those are, I believe that they are um, swallowtail caterpillars. So it's really fun to see those life cycles in your garden. Glad to, glad to give them something to eat. Um, but this one, you know, you can see flat types of parsley, curly parsley. We use it to flavor with. We also use it to garnish, so to, to make our, um, our plats, the plates and dishes look attractive. Um, it does prefer those sunny spots with a, with a bit of moisture. It will overwinter, so you can get the, you know, when we say biennial, it means it completes its, its flowering that second season. We need a little bit of chilling, a little bit of cool temperatures to trigger that flowering process. So I will leave my parsley in the garden um, this fall uh, we'll go through the winter, the winter months, it'll get that chilling and next spring it will be flowering and it will set seed um, at that point. So fun little herb to have. Um, I grew borage again this year. I really like this flower because of the, um, this herb because of the blue flower. Um, this, is, you typically see um, borage used for skin treatments or, you know, masks and things like that. Um, I think of borage in terms of those beautiful blue flowers being used as garnishes. Um, I don't eat it. Um, uh, supposedly there's a cucumber flavor there with forage, but I do believe it is an attractive annual and I grow it, um, grow it as such. It will self-seed. It gets tall. Um, at the end of its run, it's rather ugly, so just cut it down and <laughs> uh, throw the, the foliage onto the compost pile. Um, it too is one that will take that poor soil and be just fine. Um, I bet a few of us, if you're, if you're any at all uh, in the kitchen using herbs, we've probably used our uh, laurel, uh, bay laurel, uh, laurus nobilis. Um, 
it's not winter hardy so much uh, further north from us colder climates, but we can often get away with it here, but we often grow it in containers and overwinter it inside. Um, if it's tricky, again, I've had my plant completely defoliate um, and then, you know, flush back out when I have brought it inside um, over the winter. And then when I take it back outside, it refoliates. So um, it prefers sunny, but a little bit sheltered uh, location. So I have mine um, on the eastern side of the house and it is quite happy. Uh, they can get get tall. I've heard reports of really tall bay plants, um, but if you're growing it in a container and you're clipping it regularly, you're not going to get that kind of height out of it. Um, so this is a laurel, the laurel that you used in cooking, and we use our leaves to flavor our sauces, soups, and stews, and we pull that leaf out before we uh, actually consume. All right, so that's a little bit, just kind of like a real quick run through some of the favorite herbs. But what I wanted to share with you today is, you know, we've got that basic um, understanding and there's so many more plants, so many more plants that really fit that really broad definition of herbs. But those, these are some that we are very commonly familiar with. So let's talk about enjoying them. Uh, we get, we're gonna enjoy them in our gardens as well as in our kitchens. And so when I think about in our gardens, herbs are, um, you know, really multifaceted. They are part of our flower borders. I mentioned to you, I bring them in as cut flowers. That's a personal preference. So basil can smell kind of funky when you bring it in as a cut flower and you put it in your, um, in your vase. So that, that flavor and that scent that you enjoy in your, uh, say your Italian cooking, you may not, might not really appreciate in your cut flower vase, but it's very attractive and it holds up. You've got those little white flowers and of course foliage of all different colors. Um, again, herbs in our garden provide food sources for many insects. Uh, and of course we can achieve lots of different design elements with our herbs. Um, mentioned the mixed borders. The, the picture on the right is not my garden. That's, that's a um, public garden that I have visited. Uh, but the photos on the left are combinations that I've done right here in my own garden. So the middle shot, my purple basil was planted right in there with my cosmos, you know, just that mixed, truly a mixed border, had it in there with some lavender and some, um, some nepeta and, you know, just lots of different things. And that photo on the left is my pineapple sage, which is finally coming into bloom. And it is, it has that sweet pineapple-y fragrance uh, foliage, but in the lower left hand corner of that photo is a zinnia bud. It's planted right in, you know, right in line with my other flowers. So enjoying those mixed plantings. Um, this is a shot of some perennial herbs, the rudbeckia, the echinacea, the vitex, and these are in a mixed planting. Um, so, so we get a lot of uses out of our herbs in, you know, an ornamental sense in our garden. Um, formal designs we can make our, our not gardens. I think of um, the, um, Lavender cotton, um, the, this genus is escaping me at the moment, but it is a, uh, it's a, um, um, oh my goodness, it's just escaped me. But anyway, it, it mounds and can be clipped and, and closely and it's gray and it's green and it has a you know, flower to it. So we can make not gardens. These are, these in, in the picture um, are actually barberry and boxwood plantings and there's yarrow in the background on the right hand side. Uh, but the formal not being present in the herbal garden there at Hills and Dales in LaGrange. Um, but just as a guide, if you're thinking, how do I put these, these herbs together in my garden uh, from a size perspective? If we're talking about Monarda or Angelica or Bay or Vibascum or Rebecca, Echinacea, Salvia, Dill, Foxglove, uh, Comfrey, all of those are tall plants. And we would generally put those to the back of a garden if it's a one-sided garden or if we've got a garden that maybe we're looking at walking all around it, those might be in the center, you know, where we, where we would want our height. Um, some of the medium-sized uh, herbs, things like basils and salvias, lavender, rosemary, or alliums, you know, those garlic chives and those um, uh, regular chives, those would be medium-sized. And oregano is put in the medium category because even though it's kind of a creepy ground cover, by the time you get those floral scapes on there, it can actually get a little bit of height to it. So we would put that in the medium category. And then we have the low herbs, those things that um, tend to hug the ground a lot of our thymes, some of our oreganos, some of our mints, dwarf mints, uh, parsleys uh, on the low side. Um, so that just kind of gives you some, some guide uh, to how to arrange them. 
And then of course the fragrance. So you know, I've been showing you pictures of, of things that are beautiful in terms of their color, their blooms, but herbs have a lot of fragrance, a lot of assorted um, smells and scents, and we can really appreciate them and use them in our gardens for that reason as well. So here's just a couple more herbs, uh, plants that can be classified as herbs. We don't even, I mean, I don't even think of echinacea being an herb because it's such a reliable perennial. We see it often and there's been so much hybridization with it that you can get it in yellow colors and oranges and you know, um, pinks that range from light pink to dark, almost purple. Uh, so echinacea purpurea, uh, a very reliable perennial for our gardens. Um, roses fall into that category. Those rose hips are high in vitamin C and we can make jams and jellies and all kinds of things out of them. So we've got a lot of roses. The trick with roses is that here in Georgia with our humidity, we very often usually are applying fungicides, maybe even insecticides to them. And so you wouldn't want to harvest those uh, hips or those flowers for culinary use if you have applied pesticides to them. So just a little, a little note there. Um, foxglove, uh, very often sold as a, um, a garden biennial. So it has a vegetative season and then it blooms the second season. This is considered poisonous because it can have um, um, effects on your heart. Um, it's actually used as part of cardiac medicines, um, but uh, as long as you are not ingesting it, it's a very attractive plant. Um, peonies don't, don't thrive so much down here in the middle to the southern part of the state, and you can get away with them in the northern part of the state, but oh, I miss them. I've, I've moved here from Virginia, and I really do miss, miss my peonies. They are just such gorgeous flowers. Um, they are considered herbal as well, um, but they are so showy, so attractive that their flowers can, can be really an asset to the garden. Uh, calendula, another herb uh, traditionally used as a dye, a fabric dye, and also used in foods and cosmetics. Um, so we can eat both the leaves and the petals in, in, uh, from this herb, and this is an annual, uh, but also um, grown for, for its flowers. Grow it as, as, a, as, a, um, as an ornamental type of plant. Uh, Baptisia, a perennial, uh, we get the dye, the blue dye from this, but it also has um, medicinal uh, historical uses. This is a perennial, tall perennial, but that blue, oh my goodness, it just, it's a beautiful blue. Uh, so again, an attractive um, addition to our herbal gardens. Uh, Monarda, man, this is another one of those herbs that would do much better in my northern gardens and I miss it. But every once in a while, I stumble across it in Georgia gardens and um, it's doing pretty well. It's very prone to powdery mildew here. So years like this year where we had a lot of disease pressure, uh, this plant's going to struggle. Uh, but, but available in a wide range of colors. It's kind of got a pinkish color in this photo here, uh, but it's, it, you know, it's available in reds and whites and purples. Um, not only is it attractive, um, you know, uh, and, and, attra and is, you know, provides uh, food for our insects, um, but this is tasty. You know, we've got a lot of teas. You think about your, um, your uh, oh my goodness, my mind is just going this morning. It'll come to me, but it's a tea that we drink um, that, that has that Monarda underneath of it. Some of our Earl Greys and, and um, other types of teas. Um, then uh, also I have used the flowers and the foliage in baking. So cookies and stuff like that. So pretty distinctive flavors. Um, ladies mantle, Alcamilla mollis is another perennial that um, has historically herbal uses, but it's also fantastic in the garden. Just a great addition there on the border. Um, many of you have probably grown nasturtiums. I think of nasturtiums as kind of an old fashioned sort of plant, uh, but we can use those flowers as, um, as uh, ornaments and they are certainly edible and have that little bit of peppery bite to them. And many of us are probably familiar with ginkgo. Um, probably need some of this too because it's supposed to be a memory enhancer since I'm forgetting all my words this morning. Um, but uh, again, a very attractive addition to our gardens. That fabulous fall color. We're anticipating that in October. All right, so those are kitchen um, additional, excuse me, those are additional herbs that we would use in our garden, ways that we would use them in our gardens. And again, many of you on here, I suspect are very familiar with growing herbs. Uh, but but um, 
most of our herbs do require a well-drained soil. We don't fertilize them heavily. So their, their best flavor, their best fragrance comes uh, when they're grown um, almost with abuse. <laughs> We're not gonna feed them like we would uh, say our, our other ornamental types of annuals. Many of their herbs are drought tolerant. So in conditions you know, where we don't have a lot of rainfall, um, they're gonna be great uh, landscape additions to the garden. Um, and as I said, as we were going along, I tried to point out those that were annuals. So those that won't, won't overwinter, um, that complete their cycle in one year and are not winter hardy versus those that will come back year after year as perennials. Um, the one thing about herbs, well, there's many things about herbs, but they are relatively easy to grow and they don't have a lot of pests. Some will have a few insect pests or disease issues, but most of the time they are so easy to grow. You don't have, they're not fussy. Um, if you give them the correct location in the garden, they are good to go. Um, and they are pretty adaptable. You see this rock wall here. Um, they can grow in little cracks and crevices and they can grow in um, this over on the right hand side. Somebody's made a container out of uh, plastic bottles. So limited soil volume, low moisture, so we can get really creative with our plants and with our herbs. And they're also great in containers. I've mentioned that a couple of times here. Um, sometimes people will keep them on their windowsill. So keep them as a potted herb in their windowsill. But other times we have them um, in container gardens, just as we would have our petunias or our geraniums and such. So um, it's really handy to keep a collection of herbs planted right outside the kitchen door so that when you need a piece of rosemary or a piece of basil or dill or whatever, all you have to do is open that door and snip it off and come right back inside. It's pretty nice when it's raining too. <laughs> um, and of course, in the garden, we can use our um, herbs as ground covers, um, especially between stones. If we're walking over them, uh, the, the fragrance will often be released as we, as we bruise them as we're walking through. Um, so very versatile and useful additions to our landscapes and gardens. So we use our herbs in our uh, gardens, so we're really enjoying them there. We're going to enjoy them in our kitchen, so hopefully this next little piece will give you some ideas. Again, if we were in person, I would have given you some samples. Uh, some of our herbs are savory, and some of them are sweet. If you remember the stevia, uh, stevia is used as a, as a sugar substitute. And as I said earlier, some are very perfumey, so things like our lavender really has a perfumey taste. And when we're enjoying our herbs, we can use them in many different ways. We can use them um, to flavor oils and vinegars, which will then be used in salad dressings or glazes or um, uh, sauces. Um, I love this. I, again, we would have had so much fun if we were in person. We can use our herbs to flavor all kinds of sweet desserts, things like ice creams and slushes and popsicles, cakes and cookies. This photo here on the, on, on the front lower right is a lavender cookie. These are not my cookies, but I have made them before. Like I said, that, that, the steep perfumey lavender taste carries through into those cookies. And I will say that lavender and lemon are often paired together. So you can pair those herbs often uh, together. Um, savory and sweet breads, both yeast and quick bread. So both of those. Um, the photo in the upper right hand corner, I believe is lemon rosemary, but lemon thyme. Lemon verbena, great additions to uh, quick and sweet breads that we can enjoy. The photo on the left is a swirled pesto bread. So if you're a, a fan of basil, um, we grow basil here at our household and make pesto. Um, and we can roll it up uh, kind of jelly roll style in bread. We can use it in lieu of say a tomato based sauce on pizza. Uh, it's great on focaccia bread, so, you know, not only as a, as a condiment, but also in this case, rolled actually up in the bread and baked in the bread. So lots of things that you can do with your herbs in terms of breads. Then beverages, and I bet many of us are thinking, oh, herbal tea, uh, chamomile tea, peppermint tea, those are really nice hot teas. Um, yes, I drink a lot of hot tea. Uh, but also our herbs are great for cold beverages. So in that upper right hand corner is a photo of lavender lemonade. I told you lavender and lemon get paired frequently. Um, again, I'm not a fan, but um, I love the idea of it. And I love certainly adding those um, flavors to my 
to my menus when I'm planning um, events. Uh, on the left hand side, the herbal tea, cold tea, as I mentioned, mint tea, I find particularly refreshing when I've been outside working in the garden. Um, but we can make all kinds of, uh, it doesn't have to be mint tea, it could be lemon tea, a lot of lemon, the lemon balm, lemon verbena, those kinds of things can be used to flavor our teas as well. So iced or hot, um, lots of different beverage choices there. Um, so I shared a few recipes, I sent that to Haley and um, hopefully she'll share that with you. Uh, these are just a few recipes that I would have demonstrated for you, but just, you know, underscoring that versatility. These herbs are just not only beautiful, but they're really, really useful. And uh, just wrapping up that, uh, this bit about using, you know, using them in the kitchen, enjoying our herbs in the kitchen. Just a few tips about preserving herbs. So we're coming to the end of our growing season now. And so looking ahead to, you know, how would I want to use these herbs throughout the winter? We can freeze them. You know, some people will freeze them, you know, dice up little bits of the herbs, put them in ice cube trays, add enough water to freeze them. Uh, you can actually clip the herb uh, foliage, wash it, drain it and pat it dry. You wanna be gentle so that you don't bruise the tissues and you know, release all of their oils. But you do wanna wash off the dust and knock off any sort of critters that might've come in with it. Um, and then wrap it in freezer paper, which gives a little bit of protection and place it in a freezer bag. Don't forget to label and date it. So if you come across a bunch of uh, packages of freezer wrap and you're like, what is this? Uh, you'll want to be able to remember what it was that you wrapped up and put in your freezer. Uh, so just a couple of different ways to freeze it. And then of course, drying. We're probably familiar with, when we think about drying herbs, at least anyway, my mind goes to the picture on the right where you bundle the herbs and you hang them upside, to upside down to dry. Um, I have a dehydrator, which is the, the photo on the left. And I actually dried my basil um, low and slow. Um, our food, um, I'm looking to see if my book is here. Our, yes, it is. Our food preservation specialist, uh, Elizabeth Andrus, that puts out our So Easy to Preserve book, um, will tell you that if you dry your herbs at any temperature above 140, then you're actually cooking them. You are not drying them and preserving them. Uh, so there's a technical difference there. Um, so you can either air dry or oven dry, or um, again, use a, a dehydrator because often our ovens do not go that low, don't have the, that low of a setting. Um, so <clears throat> again, just putting all of this stuff together, it's so much fun to enjoy our herbs. They're so easy to grow. They have a lot of beautiful aesthetic um, benefits, and then we can use them in so many different ways, not only in the garden, but in the kitchen as well. So just a wonderful set of plants to enjoy. Um, and so I will uh, conclude here, Haley, with just a few resources. Uh, we do have a great publication, UGA Extension publication, Herbs in Southern Gardens. And I held up the book, So Easy to Preserve. That is just a classic resource for any sort of food preservation, including herbs. And then the recipes that I sent to you um, are from a book titled Favorite Recipes with Herbs. So I just put that um, citation there in case anybody needed that information. So with that, Anybody got any questions or stories you want to share? Let's see, we can try to unmute Miss Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, am I unmuted? Yes, we unmuted you. Do you have any questions for Miss Sharon? Yes, okay. So you mentioned, by the way, it was very good, but there's a lot of herbs and I've kind of got lost a little bit. But, um, <laughs> Um, but I was listening, and because I'm kind of, oh, my Haley knows, I'm like, oh. So anyway, I've got this large rectangle right, uh, in my outside, okay, that looks terrible right now, as you know, a lot of things do. If you were going to plant things in there right now, what would I plant? Herbs. Herbs. Do you, are you looking uh, for I don't know. things I like that you would You said plant. mint is good all the time. I don't know. I mean, I, I've got rosemary and it can grow. I've got it in a container. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, I was thinking, I, I love the way all your colors go together. And it was really pretty. And um, my husband cooks all the time. And, but I don't know what can be planted at, at a perennial. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm thinking that either the t some of the thyme varieties or yeah. even the oregano would okay, make like this um, all right so you could use those on the outside kind of like as a border okay you know kind of on the edge mm -hmm. um 
things like the echinacea, which is your purple coneflower or your black eyed Susan, um, Baptisia, or even, um, like I said, you could go Monarda, but you'll probably have years where it looks really wretched because it's so prone mm -hmm. to powdery mildew. But all of those are floral blooming types of things. Mm -hmm. And those would look really pretty in the center uh, mm -hmm. because they're taller. Mm -hmm. um, pineapple sage is really pretty and Mexican sage as well. So I showed you a picture of pineapple sage and that blooms red and it has a pineapple scented foliage to it. The Mexican sage, um, not so culinary, but, um, but certainly very attractive, a purple bloom to it. Those are real tall. You can put those in the, in the center as well, but those are annual. You treat those as okay. annual. Um, but they would, those would do in, this, in the fall, right? Yeah, now. Yeah, the pineapple sage and the Mexican sage are just coming into their glory. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they're, they, they're real late bloomers. They're, they're kind of a tricky thing to grow and sell um, in your garden centers because people, unless they know what they are and recognize them, they won't buy them early because they're not blooming. And by the time they're in bloom, you, you really want them to have been already established in, their, in the garden. Um, so they're kind of they're kind of tricky. You got to know what you're what you're looking for and get those. Um, you can plant but not mint, not mint. You said no mint, not unless it's in a container. If you if you're going to grow mint, put it in a container. Um, uh, it, it will even escape if you put it in a clay pot. Yes. Uh, clay pots can, if they're unglazed, you can drop the clay pot in the ground. You know, you can plant the whole pot, and that keeps your roots from spreading. But those mint are so aggressive that they'll spread even out of the um, drainage hole on a clay pot. So, uh, wow. and, and, it, and they'll leap, they'll crawl over the top of it. Um, and so once you get mint in your garden, you know, it's just, it's one thing if you like it, but if you don't like it, it's very, it's aggressive. You know, it will spread everywhere. Um, so try to keep that in a nice pot. But will um, it grow in the fall? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if, if we end up with a, a really chilly, a really cold Georgia winter, which, you know, every once in a while we do get, right. get one of those, um, you know, then this stuff's going to get knocked back, but that's sure. okay. You know, the perennials will come back. A lot of these things are really tough. Really, you know, your thyme, your oregano, those are very, very tough um, perennial herbs that will, that will come back year after year. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. And you know, I can go to Pipes Nursery. I know I'm probably not supposed to say names, but they will help you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and they'll have those assorted herbs. Um, they'll have different, you know, different cultivars of thymes and um, oreganos that will give you some color variation. So you mentioned you're really enjoying the color. So getting some of those golden, maybe some of those yellow ones that you, if you like that yellow color, that'll be a nice uh -huh. contrast, you know, a nice color contrast to uh, some of the greens of the uh, the comb flowers and such that I mentioned. Um, so, you yeah. might you might yeah. find some of the the cool season herbs like dill and cilantro and parsley. Yes, those are those are still available, um, and you'll find some sages as well. So you know you'll still find some of that stuff, but you're not likely to find things like basil, um, which are going, we're coming to the end of its of its run. Okay. Well, that gives me an idea. At least maybe some of my yard will look so terrible. <laughs> I'm sure. You know, the dead way. sticks, you know, we're talking about that it looks so pretty, but now it's done. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> well, thank yeah. you. You're welcome. We need to have, Abby, we need to have her back where she can, we can do a recipe. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Yeah. We'll set up something. Hopefully by January, maybe we can start thinking about having face-to-face -face programs. <laughs> Yeah. And then we can figure out a time sometime, maybe later on in the spring. Or... Yeah, this one, this one is, if you want to cook and taste the herbs, then we really need to have it in the summertime when things are actively growing with a good selection of stuff to taste and sample. Yeah. But this Everybody is needs to try it. Because it, it just, I like you having written it down and then, I, and then Haley will save some of it so we can go back, you know? Well, and what I'll do too is she had sent me some of this stuff, so I'll email it to you after. Um, so probably this afternoon, I'll email it to everybody. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, any other questions? Hey, Sherry, this is Darlene. Can you hear me? I can. Hi, Darlene. Hey. Um, what can I do for you? <laughs> that was my telephone. Yes. Uh, anyway, um, that Monardo, um, it, it, that was the one that was good for skin, right? Problems? Um, I don't recall. Um, and I don't use it. I don't use it in terms of skin. I use it in ornamentals and in and cooking. So Okay, so that. where where would it be available? Where would you find Minarda? Yeah, like Home Depot or Lowe's would they have it now? Um, um, their pro their product lines are so seasonally driven. So, you know, um, they, they have a, a, a different sort of uh, program. Um, if you're looking for something like Minarda right now, I would probably go to a smaller garden center, you know, a, a business that focuses specifically on plants um, right. and has, has a broader selection of plants and you'll most likely find them there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? I don't know, is it storming up there and scalding and it just like the bottom fell out here. Well, it started that way about seven o'clock this morning. I, I was, it shocked me, you know, just the thunder, but um, I don't think it's raining at the moment, at the moment. <laughs> Mom, do you have any questions? Oh, well, I keep getting dropped from the off snow. Yeah, well, I just brought you back in. I think it's yeah. probably because of the weather. Yeah, I've been back and forth back and forth, so. Uh, not, well, I do have one. What do you wash, wash them in if they get sprayed with pesticides? Um, so you could wash them, um, you could wash them in a, a soapy water. Um, in fact, this is how I'm knocking a lot of insects off. I'm planting broccoli and they came with um, some of their, the fall uh, um, garden pests. But just a little bit of uh, like Dawn dish detergent and swishing, you know, the foliage around in there. If it's, it depends on what the pesticide is. Um, if it is a systemic pesticide, so one that has been applied to the roots and the plant has taken it up into the foliage, then you do not want to consume that. Um, but if it's something like, um, you know, a soap or a plant-based um, uh, pesticide that's going to, you know, have a short, sh short lifespan, it's going to, you know, um, um, uh, decompose rapidly, you know, get, get past that, uh, that toxic uh, point. Um, then usually just that light washing with a light detergent. Uh, and again, you're not talking, you're talking like a drop, you know, a drop or two of this, of the soap in a, in a water and you're swirling around um, and you want to make sure that you rinse that off as well because you don't want to ingest the soap. Absolutely. You know, if you're eating the soap, you're not, you're not anywhere, you know, you're not, a, not ahead of the game there. Uh, right. But again, you know, just making sure you check your, if you know what, app, what pesticide has been applied, um, like if the herbs are in a, you know, a vegetable garden and they've gotten overspray or something, um, you can check that harvest interval. So it, it will give you a days to, you know, a harvest um, interval, how many days have to elapse before you can harvest and eat. Um, and then washing it, washing it um, off. Um, before mm -hmm. and one more question. Are there any herbs that are specifically deer resistant or deer tolerant? Um, most of them tend to be pretty tolerant um, because of the pungent scents and flavors in herbs. Um, we don't tend to have a whole lot of damage from deer. Um, if they get the tender floral buds or whatever, you know, that can happen. Things like your echinaceas and your, and your rudbeckias, the deer will graze on that. Um, uh, does it, uh, they're the proper. They're not so pungent. The, the the they don't have a scent or a taste to them. That's not their not their um, their property. Um, but yeah, most of the other culinary types of herbs that we use, the deer won't mess with. Um, I, I have in fact, I use that kind of as a dis, as disguise. That uh, up until recently, I had my raised beds in the backyard were just in, out in the open, and deer would come through there all of the time. Um, and they, they didn't t tend to mess with things when there were, like my dill is kind of free range. I let it do its thing. So it's not foolproof by any means. Don't, don't hear what I'm saying is it will absolutely work because deer are, um, you know, it, yes, if they're hungry, they're going to eat it, but, but usually they don't mess with it, with those, 
fragranty things too much. Mm -hmm. And there in Texas, you all probably grow a lot of herbs because they can they don't take a whole lot of water. Right, they're good, but we have um, probably you know a dozen deer that sleep in our yard at night, so it's uh, nothing is safe. <laughs> that is true. Nothing is safe. Well, they Unless you're gonna like wire. Well, they even come up on like the back deck. They go up the stairs and we'll go get. <laughs> yes, yes. You would have to have all those wire cages and things over your pots to, to protect them. And yeah, at some point it gets a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Good to have you with us. Do we have any other questions? Well, I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording it.